Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. My guest today is Adam Braun. So Adam is a founder and CEO of Pencils of Promise. It's a nonprofit organization that builds schools, increases access to education for children in the developing world. And to date, they've built more than 200 schools around the world, with a new one being opened every 90 hours. He's also the creator of the For Purpose or Profitable Purpose uh, business model, and He's the author of a new book called The Promise of a Pencil. So awesome to be hanging out with you today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I love what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's affecting so many people on so many different levels. Uh, you know, We've talked about different ways to get involved. And, and I really I want to go into what Pencils of Promise is, what it's bringing to the world. Um, but I also want to explore your personal journey because right now you're the founder of this incredibly fast-growing organization that's supporting education around the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, you were living a very different life, literally only like a few years yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take me back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess if I take you all the way back, uh, I was born in New York City, but I grew up in the suburbs. And um, my parents were a dentist and orthodontist, but a lot of my friends' parents uh, ranged in their professions. But I, I saw a pretty big uh, income disparity. Uh, and I saw that the people who had the most, uh, their parents tended to be uh, individuals that were either running large financial institutions, mainly hedge funds mm. and um, major banks, or they were CEOs of really large companies. And, you know, kind of as a kid, uh, I just became obsessed with this idea of working on Wall Street. Mm. Uh, I played every sport possible, but basketball was really my thing. And when I looked at the kind of way to stay competitive, and I loved, um, you know, collecting basketball cards, that was a big thing for me. And you ch- kind of pick the best card and then look at it in Beckett's magazine right. and then see, you know, did it grow in value? And then you trade it with friends. And I thought, how could I just do this forever? And when I started to learn that my friends' parents that were living in these huge houses were actually doing that, but with stocks, doing that, right. <laughs> I thought, man, I could just essentially pick great baseball cards, but they're called stocks and bonds and all that stuff. So... Um, started working at hedge funds when I was uh, 16 in the summers and then fund of funds when I was 19, had this incredible exposure to the financial industry and um, was just on a really clear cut path to hopefully make a lot of money. And that's all I was really focused on until I was 21. Hmm. And at that point in time, uh, I saw a film called Baraka that yeah. was shot in 24 countries around right. the world. My guess is it sounds like you're familiar with I that. am, yeah. And um, Baraka just blew my mind. Uh, exploded everything that I thought I knew. And I remember sitting in a dorm room late one night, a uh, sophomore in college, thinking, if this is happening somewhere in the world uh, at this very moment, you know, these people are living these lives that I'm seeing on this screen, I need to go witness it with my own eyes. I just need to go to these places, talk to these people, mm. and really break out of my comfort zone more than anything else. And so learned about the Semester at Sea program, uh, cruise shift, went around the world, and Um, If you've seen Baraka, you know the one scene where they um, are burning bodies on the banks of the Ganges River. It just, I never felt anything the way that I felt when I saw that that, um, shot. And in particular, the the spiritual element really struck me because I was kind of going through a lot of spiritual rebirth at that point in my life, Mm -hmm. kind of evaluating my upbringing and what I believed and what I didn't. And so um, when I was... Tell me, I mean, also, yeah, so... You've got a book which yeah. yeah opens with a lot about your upbringing. So right. F- yeah. Fill that in a little bit more so we have some more context there. Sure. So um, I'm the child uh, of obviously two parents, but my grandparents um, in particular were really formative on my upbringing and, and the way that I was raised. Um, but I'll, you know, the book really focuses just on one side of my grandparents, although my other grandparents have an incredible story as well. Mm-hmm. But it's really about my dad's side and in particular my grandmother. Uh, Her name's Eva, but we always called her Ma, and she was taken out of school when she was 14 years old, first put into um, a ghetto, then into cattle cars, and taken to Auschwitz with uh, 28 other family members, including her 12-year-old sister and her mother. And every one of them was told to go to the left, and she was told to go to the right. And she refused. She was beaten until she was unconscious. And when she awoke in the barracks and she said, where's my family, they pointed to the smokestacks, and her entire family had been... Um, killed in a gas chamber and essentially cremated um, that that day. And so through a series of miracles, she survived uh, over about a year and a half through Auschwitz and then Bergen-Belsen, another camp that she claims was even worse. And so throughout my upbringing, we were always raised with this profound sense of, um, I would say, appreciation for even the little things. 
And we grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, which was this really great, you know, well-known affluent town. Mm -hmm. But the way in which we were raised was just kind of different. And the opening chapter of the book uh, is titled um, uh, Why Be Normal? Mm -hmm. And it's because my dad would say to us every night, um, whether things were good or bad, he would say, you know why that happened? You know why you did this? You know why we're doing that? Because bronze are different. And he just reiterated to my siblings and I, my older brother, my younger sister, that whatever the norms are that you're surrounded by, you can break free of those. And he held us to what I would define as an exceptional standard. Uh, if somebody else got paid for their grades, you know, five bucks for an A. And I said, yeah, I got straight A's. Can I get 20 bucks? My dad would say, no, bronze are different. But when a kid was being bullied because of their ethnicity and no one else stood up for them, I almost had this inherent sense that, well, bronze are different. I'm supposed to be different from everybody else. I'm supposed to stand up for that mm. kid. And so uh, when I was uh, entering my senior year, uh, we met these two young boys who were from Mozambique. And they were in a really rough situation and had been uh, essentially duped into a false American education. And uh, they asked us to take them in. And so we did. And so I have two other brothers who are from Mozambique, mm. six foot six, six foot nine yeah. Africans. And so my um, my Friday night Shabbat dinners look different. From most. <laughs> and that's really what the first chapter is about, right. titled with this mantra, um, Why Be Normal, which was my dad's license plate always. Right. So that so that gives us a little bit more flavor for, yeah. for sort of like... like where your background is and how you kind of view the world a little bit differently. So, mm -hmm. so then let's let's come back to this place where you know, like, you actually you're, you're going around the world now, yeah. and now like you're actually you don't have the two kids from Mozambique coming mm -hmm. to you now, but you've had this transformative moment, literally just watching a movie, and now you're out there experiencing yeah. a radically different existence. Yeah, it was just so different from anything that I had ever really thought existed. And, you know, you have these kind of visions of, of grandeur when you think you're going out and traveling for the first time independently. Because as, as a family, we'd been on some vacations, but never into the developing world. Yeah. I had never traveled alone like that. And on semester at sea, you can get out and travel completely independently for four to six days. And mm. so I was making these new friends and I had a habit of asking one kid per country, what do you want most in the world? Mm. And I'd have them write it down on a piece of paper. And I thought I'd have this really cool collage of interest. Like one kid, one local kid. Yep. Right. One kid per country. Uh, you know, in, in China, we we're walking through the Forbidden Temple and I found this young girl and she's with her mom and I asked them kind of through, you know, broken English and, um, and Chinese, it's, can you, uh, if she could have anything, what would it be? And I'm, I'm thinking this girl's going to say a TV or, you know, some piece of technology or a house. Mm -hmm. And her answer was a book. And I thought, no, 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 she could have anything. He said, no, no, she wants a book. And then when I got to Hong Kong, I asked a kid on the street and his brother translated and his answer, if he could have anything in the world was magic, which again was just mm. so cool to me and kind of started to reframe the way in which I started to value physical possessions and kind of what my role was and what I could facilitate for others. And then when I got to India, where the poverty was just far beyond anything I could have ever imagined, and you yeah. see children begging with other children in their arms and you feel very helpless. The boy that I asked in that country, who was a beggar on the streets, if you could have anything in the world, his answer was a pencil. So I gave him my pencil. He lit up, hence our name now being Pencils of Promise. And that became my thing. I passed out pens and pencils as I would travel. And I just became obsessed with backpacking. I loved it. Hmm. I felt so alive every day. You know, your senses are kind of heightened when you're in that traveling mode. Right. And um, as I would travel, I would bring pens and pencils. And just backpack through 40, 50 countries. So this was after, years. right. So after after that actual like semester C ends. Yeah. So you're like, no, there's got to be more. My parents were really clear with me. They said, we'll support you, just not financially. Mm. And so if you want to go out and do something and you're able to make the money for it, sure, go ahead. Because that was senior year then, right? Yeah. So that, yeah. it's so like it was, after that. So it was even the summer. I mean, the summer afterwards, I did five weeks in Europe backpacking. I thought, no, no, I want to get back to the developing world. I did three weeks in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then I had my senior year in college where I just made, you know, as much as I could. And then I spent a year after college essentially traveling the whole time. Right. And what, like, what were you trying to accomplish at that point? I think I was, th there was a lot of self-discovery. I, I think I was trying to find who I wanted to, to be, not just what I wanted to be. Mm. Um, there was, uh, I would say a lot of kind of spiritual exploration. Like what, what do I believe in and why am I here? I, right. I think that question also of why, you know, why, why do I exist? And once I understand that, why, what can I accomplish with the unique position that I'm able to get myself to? Right. And the other thing was just, uh, I would say, the desire to 
live in a place of joy and happiness. I think one of the things that I've always been really cognizant of is the fact that time is really fleeting. And I had a, a certain death experience um, at one point in time that led me to almost feel like every other day is a gift. And I know that might sound a little cliche, but when you're sure you're dying an hour from now and you suddenly get to continue living, mm. um, it, it really does feel that way. And Are so, you open to sharing what that more about that? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's a long, long story, <laughs> but on my semester at Sea Voyage, our ship got hit by a 60-foot road wave about oh. 800 miles from land, shattered the glass on the, um, on the bridge on the sixth floor, and shorted out the power to our navigational equipment and uh, our engines. And so we lost all power in 40-foot swells, and um, there's a panic announcement to get to our muster stations, which is where you evacuate from. Right. And I was sure that we were going to perish at sea. And fortunately, you know, Semester at Sea handled it really well. Obviously, the program was incredible, and they did such a great job uh, in the subsequent days. But in that moment, it was like, this is it. I'm going down. And so the the... I guess next couple of months, everything had a greater depth to it. Mm. And so knowing that, you know, later in life, I was hopefully going to get married and have kids and I'd have, you know, maybe a house or a car, or mortgage, all those things. I knew that I wouldn't have the freedom that I had when I was 23 years old. And so that, that year after college where I just backpacked relentlessly, uh, a lot of that was with the knowledge that I wouldn't get that day back. Mm. And that given the freedoms of that current moment in my life, the single best thing I could do is take the little bit of money that I had and get a one-way flight to Guatemala and do four months down to Argentina and back up and just backpack as much as I could. Yeah. I mean, what a powerful experience. Not, not that you wish anybody to like, you know, like have an experience right. where they truly believe that they're about to pass. Yeah. But um, to have moved through that and then to, to survive and be okay and then to have like that awakening that says, wow, you know, like, it could be any moment mm -hmm. um, at that at such a young age, and then like to have that really change your behavior. Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, it's powerful. It, it fundamentally did, but it goes back to this core belief that I just have never been able to get out of my head, and it kind of resonates throughout the the, orga the organization, the book, and a lot of the things that I'm now working on. I would say with this kind of idea of for purpose is I think just things happen for a reason, and if you look at all of the unique circumstances that you've been in your life. Uh, the unique people that you've come across. I think every single person is here by design. Um, you wouldn't mm. just kind of be in the situations that you're in unless you had some higher purpose that you were meant to achieve. And so um, whenever I was traveling and I look back on why did I go through this almost certain death experience, I always kind of saw it as this great learning lesson that would force me to live each day with a little bit more passion, a little bit more willingness to risk it all. Hmm. Because at one point in time, it felt like I was never going to get any of that in the first place. So when you move from that and you're like, OK, I'm not going to do what probably I'm guessing like a lot of your friends were, were then yeah. about to do. Yeah. Was it easy for you to sort of convey to them what you were doing and why and, and that it was different and you had to? It was easy to describe. It was really hard to go do. I, right. I think that that's a, a big disconnect that a lot of people probably experience and, and lament is it's easy to say, yeah, I'm going to go do this or this is what I'm passionate about. To actually go walk the walk is yeah. a different story. And I will say I came back and I said, I want to go build schools. And people said, well, you got to learn some business expertise first and take advantage of the fact that you're able to get these great finance or consulting jobs. And so I, I went through finance and consulting interviews based on their advice mm. and ended up choosing between um, an investment banking job and a consulting job. And I, I chose consulting because I thought it would help me one day um, first get into private equity really quickly. Right. And then the second thing was train me to build a great organization. And I thought, I'm going to work for 20 years. And 20 years from now, I'm going to have a bunch of money. And I want to use that money to then go help um, children in poverty get better so, access. So your mind is like, I'm still committed to this, but it's 20 years off. Yes. So let me just build what I need to build. And then I'll retire and boom, that's all. That's that's what I thought when I started at Bing. Right. And I went to work at this world-class company, you know, kind of number one training you can get out of college. And it was great for six or nine months. And I suddenly picked my head up a little bit more than a year after I was living in New York. And I was just living the most self-indulgent kind of, um, I don't know, party first, friends second, work third, um, philanthropy or anything cause-based or anything outside of myself, kind of like number 20th or mm. 30th. I was doing so little to help other people. And I was also really disconnected from the traveling and the developing world where I actually felt most alive. Yeah. And um, I kind of suddenly started to decide to shift my life in that direction a little bit more. 
And I had this big epiphany one night that uh, Bain lets you leave for six to nine months to work for anybody else in your third year and come back. And I thought, oh, I could use that just to kind of dip my foot back in that that space when mm. I was a backpacker. Um, and I can start this organization called Pencils of Promise, scrape together a little bit of money with some friends and build one school and then come back to my kind of full time New York life. And maybe on the side, I'll build one school year and it'll keep me connected mm -hmm. to that side of myself that truthfully I love most and that makes me most come alive and, and hopefully be, <laughs> I don't know, the best version that other people like as well. So, um, so what happens then? <laughs> so I start and uh, put $25 in a bank account, hoping to get this first school built, do a couple low dollar events, uh, fall in love with this one community in rural Laos where let, I started. Let me fill in a blank though. So like, so you then, you take this time away from Bain. Yep. Yeah. I right. took a nine but, month leave. But your intention is literally just to Build do that short little thing and then come back. Yep. And okay. have this organization on the side right. of my full time job and go work in a big private equity firm right. or hedge fund. And I left for nine months, we got a school built, uh, came back, and we had a second school under construction, and suddenly I'm back on a Fortune 500 client that I'm supposed to be advising and consulting, mm -hmm. but I'm getting emails that the community in super rural Laos in the middle of the mountainside uh, forgot to bring their $500 worth of wood. <laughs> and so it's the, the email is <laughs> radically different. Right. Do I address the $500 worth of wood that's needed because communities have to put in 10 to 20% of the funding for every school, which they make up in materials and labor, or do I address this $3 billion client that we're <laughs> supposed to be working on? And obviously, I'm, I'm guessing you can tell which one I started spending more mm -hmm. time on, which was the, um, the Pencils of Promise side. Yeah. And so Bain started to notice it. And you know, to their credit, they called me out and said, you got to make a choice here. Uh, we're still paying you. And I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, you leave these 60 or 80, you know, you leave an 80 hour a week job to take on a 100 hour a week job instead, which mm -hmm. is your entrepreneurial pursuit. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I, I left and started working out of my apartment in early 2010 uh, on this dream to build an organization that would change not just the education space, but actually fundamentally change the way in which nonprofits operated. Mm. So you make this big jump yeah. away from Bain. You've got the job that, you know, like probably a lot of people around you are like, that's the job I would love. Like I would kill to have the job that you have. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm curious how, you know, Bronze are different. <laughs> yeah. How does that was a difference that I don't think play. my parents were too happy about. Yeah. Um, you know, they were not happy at all when I left uh, uh, Bain because, you know, my dad was an immigrant. My mom came from nothing. I was kind of the one on the safe path that, you know, they'd worked so hard to get right. me to it's that It's like the point golden of, boy. Sort of yeah, like, yeah. And I yeah. got to this place where it's like, but you're about to make so much money. How are you going to turn that down? And there's no chance for you to, you know, kind of accomplish the things that we want for you if you go into this other space. Mm. And they were philanthropic people, but they, they didn't want me to, yeah. you know, put my life into this entrepreneurial venture in the not-for-profit space. And it's one of those things where I think... Uh, you know, even the people who love you most sometimes are going to disagree with you. But if you have that inner voice that tells you, this is why I'm here, this is what I'm meant to do, mm. you can't turn away from it. And uh, a lot of people, I think, when your organization or your company reaches certain levels of success, there's kind of this assumption that it came easy mm. or that even if it was hard, you still had this core group of people that were behind you a thousand percent all the way. And that's usually not the case. It's usually everybody thinks, yeah, this is nice, but he's kind of a lunatic for trying it. Right. <laughs> and that was the approach that people had to me. And uh, I was just relentless in, in this. It was beyond belief. It was like knowledge. I just knew that we were going to build hundreds of schools hmm. and I couldn't turn away from it. And so I had to go pursue it. So you basically say, OK, this is it. Pencil of Promise yeah. full time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm almost kind of blown away that the fact that you literally just drop into a foreign country, like a developing country, yeah. and you're like, okay, let's build a school. Yeah. <laughs> I I love doing that as much as anything possible. I mean, we've now built schools in four countries, and every single one of the countries where we work starts with me in a backpack going into that country, mm. and it's been by myself in each of, each of the four, uh, just kind of showing up and figuring out a lay of the land. And, you know, I think that... That was part of why Baraka blew my mind so much, because you always have this perception that these parts of the developing world are actually so different and so challenging, and they are on the surface, but there's elements of the human experience that translate across cultures, across boundaries, across languages. Mm. And what I found actually growing up in an affluent community is that the level of joy that I witnessed in a one-bedroom 
uh, home, if you can call it that, on the floor in Vietnam uh, between two parents and their child oftentimes greatly exceeded what I witnessed in enormous mansions with five or six cars in the garage. And uh, as a, you know, starting 21, 22, 23, even up and until now, I find it's almost easier to navigate sometimes in the developing world hmm. than it is in, you know, parts of our Western culture. And yeah. then when it came time to figure out how do you build the school, uh, because I was trained as a Bain style consultant, and I had all these early finance experiences. My big belief, which continues to this day, is that uh, if you brought for-profit business acumen into addressing the greatest humanitarian issues of our time, you'd have a much greater chance of solving them. Mm -hmm. And that passion alone, as important as it is, it's not even close to enough. Uh, you really need the type of results and accountability and transparency that people get held uh, accountable to in the for-profit space. Right. And that's this whole idea behind for purpose. So go into that a little bit more, right? Because everyone knows about charity. Everyone knows about yeah. nonprofits, yeah. right? For purpose, if you're familiar with your model, and yeah. you know, I guess it's, it's gaining yeah. traction now. Yeah. You know a bit about it, but drop, explain what this is all about yeah. to people who aren't in the know, because it's pretty powerful. Yeah, and the, the impetus for it is, is another chapter in the book, and, and the title of that chapter is Change Your Words to Change Your Worth. Hmm. And what I found was that I was uh, actually at a rooftop barbecue, or not a rooftop barbecue, it was a rooftop uh, company launch uh, in Manhattan here, kind of glamorous event, all these heads of media companies and investors, and I'm talking to this guy, and it's great conversation about great tech startups on the East Coast versus the West yeah. Coast, kind of a space that, that I know pretty well. And um, he... It, one point says, what are you doing? I said, I run this nonprofit called Pencils of Promise. And he immediately kind of shuts off. Right. see like the glaze going, he yeah. looks around. And what I realized was that that term itself really inhibits the space. Hmm. Um, and that we kind of define ourselves based on this binary relationship of, are you for profit or nonprofit? And I don't think a single person that works in the nonprofit space has woken up and said, I really want to not profit today. That's not the driver at all for any of us. It's actually how do I increase, uh, how do I improve as many lives as possible? How do I create the greatest social impact? No one wants to be particularly small, especially if you're dedicating your life to something that's about impacting others. You want to have a significant impact. And so I thought, why don't we just change the language and rather than treat ourselves as non-profit, why don't we call ourselves something based on the positivity of what we do? So let's call ourselves for purpose. And when you take that idea into account, you would think, okay, all right, if we're trying to maximize our impact, what types of things would we do? All right, we'd build active partnerships, not just go to people with a hand out, but with mm -hmm. the hand you know, up and say, hey, we're a great partner. We're not a great necessarily charitable recipient all the time. And we started building out um, this model that led to us in some t you know, way, shape, and form asking for money when there's effective philanthropy involved. But there's a lot of times where we earn the money that we raise through cause marketing partnerships with big mm -hmm. companies or kind of early stage startups. And so it's it's changing the space, I, I think, in pretty meaningful ways. But my hope is that the best business minds of the emerging generation will realize that it's just as exciting and just as impactful to work on something that is for purpose in nature as it is to work on something that's for profit. So let me ask you really, um, just a very straight up question. Yeah. If, if you're moving into this model, right, mm -hmm. and you want to attract the best minds yeah. into doing what you're doing. And you would love to see this model replicated in a million different yeah. ways yeah. for a million different like ways sure. to help. Um, obviously, one of the things, the associations with nonprofit, there are a lot of associations, yeah. but one of them also is that if you go into a nonprofit, mm -hmm. you'll feel good about what you do every day, but yeah. you'll live hand to mouth for the rest of your life too. Yeah. So is, is part of this also building in like you know the finances that allow people to to yeah. live comfortably as part of this organization yeah i think that there's also going to be a shift in the conversation around compensation mm. in the nonprofit or for purpose right. space because the truth is if you want to attract the best talent you have to pay them appropriately right now anybody that works in the space knows i'm never going to have an exit where i have equity in a company i own zero yeah. percent of pencils of promise if i stop working on the organization today we've raised you know, millions and millions of dollars at this point, I will receive zero of mm -hmm. that money as my exit. And that's really what this nonprofit for profit divide is. It's your equity has no profitability in it. Um, but as I've heard people say, you know, nonprofit is a tax status, it's not a business model. Right. And for you to create something that attracts the best talent, you have to pay them competitively. And so I think that what we're going to start to see is really smart people, people who have probably made a lot of money in their life saying, I want to solve this problem and I'm going to pay appropriately for the best minds to work on it. Yeah, which is a great thing. I mean, I think it's, it seems like 
maybe just in the last five years or so to what you guys are doing, what Scott's doing with Charity Water yeah. and probably a couple of others also. Yeah. So many of like the big assumptions mm-hmm. that people have made about that like nonprofit world yeah. are kind of being shattered. Yeah. You know, and and but it also seems at the same time, and tell me if you've experienced this too, but I, I've heard from various people also that um a lot of the pushback to the new model mm-hmm. is coming actually from the old model. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. I would I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I find that a lot of donors, funders are excited about this new type of model. Um, you know, one of the things that we were able to do was to say to people, every single dollar that you give through our website goes directly into our programs, 100% of it, right. only because we had both companies and individuals say, oh, I, I don't actually need to fund this kind of programmatic only approach. I'm happy to fund all of your operations mm-hmm. or I'll just fund you because I believe in you guys as a leadership team and a collection of, you know, managers and you know entrepreneurs, right. et cetera. Um, I think that people are pretty realistic now about the difference between uh, traditional charity and philanthropy. And philanthropy is activating people and their resources around solving a problem. In my opinion, charity is much more of the ilk of like, I made a lot of money. I want to feel better about myself. I'm going to give my penance Mm. to the people who have less than me. And I don't work in the space with that ideology at all. Because the truth is, I see every person that we work with as an absolute equal. They just don't have the same opportunity that I have Hmm. um, or that I was kind of given by virtue of where I was born. Uh, I saw um, Muhammad Yunus uh, speak a couple of years ago. And one of the beautiful, beautiful metaphors that he put out there was this idea that you can put a redwood in the forest and it obviously grows to, you know, hundreds of feet. But if you put a redwood in a pot that's this big, it never has the opportunity to get to that same place. And that every single person is that same essential seed. It's just a matter of what, you know, their surroundings are, what environment mm-hmm. in which they are harvested that gives them the opportunity to go out and impact the world. And so my ambition is pretty straightforward. I want every single person to have equality of opportunity. And the best way to manifest that, in my opinion, is through access to quality education. Mm-hmm. Which- just answer my next question, <laughs> which is why education. But yeah. um, what's interesting to you is when I look at the places that you're going, mm. um, it, it seems like there are a number of, of challenges, yeah. education being one of them, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, does are, are you seeing that solving the education problem, is that is that radiating out into the types of changed outcomes that you had hoped? Definitely. Um, I mean, one of the things to keep in mind is we're a newer organization. Right. You know, we started late 2008. Started, I personally took the jump to do this full time 2010. We had mm. two schools at the time. Now we're, you know, going to be up over 200. And so a lot of the data that we're collecting, and this goes back to this four purpose approach, you know, rigorous monitoring right. evaluation, 25 plus metrics, tracked all in the field. Um, but, you know, when I looked at the data purely, when you look at increases in um, uh, GDP, and social mobility, like families moving up in the ranks and entire culture shifting, really the only demonstrated way that that's happened is by greater education for the next generation of youth. Mm. And so for me, it was kind of a, a, a no brainer that education is the one cause, in my opinion, that lifts up all others that I can say, all right, we can solve or at least chip away at these different areas by virtue of educating the next population of young people. And what we're seeing is that by, by them getting greater education opportunity, they're also starting to realize great entrepreneurial opportunities, which leads to job creation and economic opportunity. So mm. the good thing is that um, we're starting to see a lot of results. The unfortunate thing is our kids are really young. <laughs> right. And so because we build primary schools, it's right. hard to point to one you thing or another. can't drive that far out. But yeah. we also do health and sanitation and water education for our kids. And, you know, across the board, um, families are changing and not just in behavior, but in status. Nah. One of the things that um, that we were just talking about before um, is that, and, and it kind of ties along with the whole, your distinction between charity and philanthropy, mm-hmm. is the opportunity for people to not just write a check, yeah. but actually become involved in the process. And not only that, but you know, hopefully bring along family members and stuff like that. Talk to me more about this. Yeah, so um, our core at this point is really the family as a unit. Um, you know, my story, as much as I didn't realize that the, the impetus, the reason that I went out to build this first school, besides my commitment to these kids that I had met over the years, was my grandmother was turning 80. And I really wanted to do something to honor her. Mm. And getting her a set of golf clubs or a day at a spa was nice. But I thought, what can I do that would just 
really appropriately show her that her legacy is going to carry on far past just her life and into future generations. And the most meaningful way that I could do that was by building a school. And what we've now seen time and time again is it only costs us $25,000 to build a school. We can build a full classroom for $10,000. And so um, one family after another, uh, they get really excited about either personally committing to that number or they like to fundraise and get their kids involved in the fundraising activities because it it teaches them uh, elements of volunteerism of social entrepreneurship of civil service and uh, ultimately if somebody funds a full school then they one get um, dedication rights we you know put plaques that the communities help create in uh, on each school and you can say lovingly dedicated to or you know with gratitude and Mm. you know thanks to x y and z so you can name it for somebody um And then the second part is that we take people into the field and they go on these impact trips that are completely life changing in the same way that, you know, I wouldn't be on this path if I didn't go into those parts of the developing world as a young person. And what I find is that uh, the sooner in life that you can get out into these environments, uh, the more impactful it becomes. Yeah. And and I mean, you know, so we're filming this right now and have this conversation in New York City, which is, you know, and New York. (laughs) It's a lot of arrogance in New York City, and I'm raising my hand here. Look, like we believe that we're the center of the universe, and everybody eventually just comes to us. So Mm -hmm. why bother? Um, But as as you know, like a husband and as a dad, you know, to me, there's this there's this new awareness of the fact that um, I'm very aware that New York is not in fact the center of the universe, and that every day that we wake up in this city is Mm -hmm. is like this astonishing blessing Mm -hmm. that billions of people you know don't have access to the types of things that we have here and. And um, the, the the opportunity to to as a father, um, then you know, like be able to take my kid, and not just give money. You're like, mm-hmm. okay, so maybe we create a campaign here mm-hmm. that helps to raise money mm-hmm. to build a school there, but actually, to take them and yeah. say like, this is the kid you're helping. Yeah. Like these are like the dozen kids who are like your age, mm-hmm. and they're like you. Yeah. You know, they're that's. It's real. Yeah. The, one of the most powerful things that I've witnessed time and time again in the field with families is the sense of appreciation that young kids return home with mm. for their own education. And I, I've had a lot of parents say to me, you know, I couldn't get my kid to care that much about yeah. school until they went and they saw those kids in Ghana learning under a mango tree. And they thought, well, wh- where's their school? And the parent had to explain, well, they don't have one. Or, mm. you know, their teacher doesn't feel like showing up. And so Pencils of Promise is now, you know, working in this community, doing teacher training. And, um, you know, or the kid, uh, girls in particular, they'll finish primary school, but they don't go on to secondary school because of costs. And the parents often have to choose a boy or a girl. And more often than not, they choose the boy instead of the girl. So mm. our scholarship program in most areas of rural Ghana, 30 to 40 percent of students go on. Uh, it's secondary school. In our communities where we have our scholarship program, it's 97%. Mm, wow. And so when uh, a student from the United States who's gone to a great prep school and, you know, the Upper West Side uh, goes into a rural community and sees, oh, my gosh, that's the first girl in the history of her family to go on to secondary school. And it only costs $250 for her to be able to get that scholarship. Mm. I can go home and my friends and I can raise $2,500 and 10 kids just like her are going to go to school next year. That's so powerful for a young person here. And that was one of the things that kind of drove me to start the organization was this idea that we could teach those values to young people and that they would ideally become, you know, the next generation that would improve the, the world and make it a better place than, you know, the one that they inherited. Yeah. So coming full circle, bonds are different. Right. Like when you go back to your folks now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Now my parents are very happy about things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think like any parent, you know, you worry. You want safety and security for yeah. your kid. And, um, you know, in the book, I talk about a couple of the kind of crazy things that happened. I had a gun pulled on me in Guatemala. Almost got, dis- you know, basically dismembered by a mob in Nepal. Um, those are not things that they ever wished for their son to go mm-hmm. and uh, I guess, kind of see and witness firsthand and, and almost be a part of. But uh, at this point in time, I think they're they're proud. Um, you know, our 10th school was dedicated to them. Mm-hmm. And I didn't tell them about it. They came out and I said, you know, I want to take you up this hill and show you this school. It had been open for about six or eight months. So the walls are just lined with beautiful drawings. And, mm-hmm. you know, th- it was a fully functioning school. So the kids are in there and uh, really using it. And it was very emotional. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of tears shed on both sides. And I think since then, they've kind of had this recognition that, wow, that this organization is going to be about a lot more than just our family. But it, it, if it can do this for other families, yeah. then that's a great thing. 
Very cool. So, so the name of this project is a good life project. Mm. So if I offer that term out to you to live a good life, what does it mean to you? That's a great question. You know, I think I think a good life is one in which you you attain personal fulfillment through a sense of purpose. I, I really see that as a good life. And that's kind of one of the things that I feel like I'm also different from people in the nonprofit space. I'm a realist. I, I think altruism has an element of selfishness because it brings joy to you as well. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't say good life is purely service to others because a lot of people go through service to others but live very angry lives. And so I think of a, a good life as one in which you attain personal fulfillment, you attain joy, but you do so through this this tapping into your sense of purpose. And purpose, I've yet to find somebody find purpose that didn't include service to others. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed the conversation. Oh, really, me too. It's really been interesting. So my guest today has been Adam Braun. He's the, the founder of Pencils of Promise and the author of The Promise of a Pencil, How an Ordinary Person Can Create Extraordinary Change. I'm Jonathan Fields, signing off for Good Life Project. Mm -hmm.